Amen. Thank you, Wanda, for playing for us tonight. If you have your Bibles close at hand, we're in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk, chapter number one. Habakkuk is next to the book of Nahum and the book of Zephaniah. If you still have no idea where it is, definitely go to the table of contents and it will tell you what. what <laughs> like if I go to a lot of uh, people that uh, have been studying their Bibles for a long time, they could have an understanding of what Habakkuk was about. Um, and so it's just kind of an interesting thing. We don't, you know, we just uh, go with what, uh, what we're uh, used to. Um, so not many times do I go, oh, let me, let me read the book of Nahum. Let me go book, look at book at Zephaniah. Right now, I'm just finishing Deuteronomy in my uh, personal quiet time. So, yeah, so big books, and they usually go through them. These little books, uh, they, they don't take too much time to go through, but boy, they're, they are packed full of spiritual wisdom for us. Um, if you're able to stand, please stand for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be reading Habakkuk chapter 1. Let's start with verse number 1 all the way to verse number 11. Verse number 1 says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me? to behold grievance, for spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth, for the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Behold ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days, which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce then the evening wolves and their horsemen shall spread themselves, and their horsemen shall come from far. They shall fly as the eagles that hasteth to eat. They shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind, and they shall gather the captivity as the sand, and they shall scoff at the kings, and their princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this his power unto his God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening that you have given us. We thank you for your word, and we, we know it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Father, may your spirit use it tonight in our hearts and minds as we contemplate the things that, that you have in your word. And Father, may we be a useful tool in your, in your hand, Father. And we ask you to help us as we contemplate things of, of just seeing things from your perspective. And Father, we ask you to bless this time that we have together. Help me as I speak. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The one thing that I have learned quite a bit when I... So we... Uh, bought a house, moved into it about four years ago, and one thing that I have learned to do is how to become my own handyman. So it's kind of the interesting thing. Things break down, and either you have to pay somebody to take care of it, or you have to figure it out yourself. And so I uh, tend to say, well, I, I think I could look into that. I think I can fix that. So lo and behold, the dryer went out. And so I'm like, okay, Laura said, there, yeah, it doesn't heat anymore. It still goes around and around in circles, but it doesn't do anything except for going around and around in circles. So it doesn't heat. And so, okay, what's the problem? So I go on to YouTube, very helpful, very handy. And it said, okay, here's how you do it. And so I'm like, okay, that's great. That's fantastic. So I get on my, on my knees and get, well, we have a piece of carpet right next to it. So I'm like, all right, 
twisted on, and I put, I got down and laid down on the ground, got everything ready, got, got the panel all taken care of. I looked in there, and I said, wow, that's a lot of wires and a lot of other stuff. Okay, so I'm looking for this particular panel, and so what I need to do is have a certain tool to go and actually undo some bolts that are within this little panel underneath the dryer, and that is the heating element. I thought, okay, that's easy. I don't have that tool. Well, let's try another tool. Maybe that will be a helpful thing. And so I went to my uh, little drawer, drawer full of uh, tools and, and things. And, and I don't even, like, I used uh, 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 needle nose pliers. I used a couple of wrenches. You know, the one thing I learned from that is if you have the right tool for the right situation, it actually turns out better and a lot less time do you have to commit to trying to fix something. And so for me, for the very first time that I'm trying this out and doing all this stuff underneath the dryer, it took me like two or three hours just to get the stuff unloosened that if you had the right tool, you'd be done in 15 minutes. And so, so what did I do? The next time the dryer broke, which wasn't too long from that point, uh, I said, you know what? Let me just go and get the right tool for the job. And so I got the right tool, and lo and behold, I am now a professional dryer. Uh, no, not really. <laughs> I can fix the dryer if, it, if these things go out. I know how to fix it. It's actually very easy. These little sensors go out, and so you just have to replace it with another sensor, screw it in, and then that's it. You know, it, it, it's fine. So praise the Lord, I was able to not need to buy another dryer for a long period of time, and still it works to this day. But the thing that it taught me, though, once again, is that if you don't have the right tool for the right job, it's going to be a hassle and a half. But the right tool for the right occasion, it actually is the best thing that could ever happen if you're trying to fix something. Now, for us, we look at Habakkuk, and Habakkuk is an amazing um, uh, uh, book of the Bible because, one, we really don't know all the ins and outs about Habakkuk except for his name and precisely about round about the time period that he lived. So he lived during a point in time where the godly king, Josiah, just passed off the scene. So he, he understood, okay, this is what it's like to have a righteous ruler uh, actually doing what he's supposed to, and Josiah was the best king, and you can argue about that, whether David was the best or Josiah was the best. Well, the Bible says Josiah was actually better than David. And so Josiah, being a very godly king, he is now passed off the scene, and now his son Jehoiakim came in, and unfortunately, he undid everything that Josiah started or reintroduced into the, uh, the nation of Israel as to what they're supposed to do. So Jehoiakim did exactly 180 degrees, and now, unfortunately, the wicked are ruling. And so we're going to see, once again, this next part in our series of Why God Why?, here in the very first four verses, we looked at that last week, but we'll review it as we progress in this book. The first thing that we saw last week, what we can learn from the text, is first of all, number one, Judah deserves to be judged. Judah deserves to be judged. Now look back at it with me. We're not going to spend too much time on this since we did it last week, but see what he says. Verse number two, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore, the law is slack. The word slack there means, uh, means powerless. It's not doing its job. And judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth come pass about the righteous. Therefore, wrong judgment proceedeth. So here at this point in time, he is acknowledging the fact that why he's asking the question, let me go ahead and paraphrase it, God, why aren't you taking care of the wicked? 
The wicked are doing all these different things, and you're doing nothing about it. Sometimes that's what it feels like in our world today, that the righteous are being persecuted, and the wicked, they get everything handed to them. It seems like that at, at, in a way. But God tells him specifically that Judah deserves to be judged. So he acknowledges that. But then we're going to see, secondly, that God allows or allowed Babylon to be the instrument of judgment, though they are, and I, I think I coined this word, wickeder. I'm not sure if that's a word. More wicked? Okay, uh, I'm really bad at English. Okay, there you go. But hey, wickeder, it, it starts. <laughs> anyway, all right. <laughs> and so notice with me the description of these people, of these Babylonians. Notice with me, verse number five. Behold, ye among the heathen. So let me just stop right there. There is a transition in the text that if you're not careful, you're not going to be reading it correctly. The first four verses is Habakkuk actually praying to God, saying, God, why are you so silent? And then the very next verse is no longer Habakkuk actually talking, but now it's God speaking to Habakkuk. And so he said, Behold, ye among the heathen, and regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe, though it be told you. For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity shall proceed of themselves. Their horses also are swifter than the leopards and are more fierce than the evening wolves. And their horsemen shall spread themselves and their horsemen shall come from a from far, and they shall fly as the eagles that hasteth to eat. Just imagine with me these individuals, the description that God gives the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, as they're coming upon the city of Jerusalem. This is what they are like. In fact, it's, it's interesting for me to, to find out a little more about this guy named uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, interesting individual. He started to be king after his he, his father passed off the scene. He actually, before that, was a conquering general in his dad's army. So he went after di various different places. He went against Egypt and won against Egypt. He went against the Assyrians and won against the Assyrians. He was a great general. He was a great military force. He knew how to fight, and he knew how to get his people to fight for him. So he was absolutely a man that knew what he was doing when he was conquering a land. And then you see that he, he is able to, to maneuver his people in such a way that it, it's amazing to see that what how it is described, the horses and the horsemen, they're as evening wolves. They're, they're as an eagle that flies for its prey. How quick is that? One time I was out there uh, switching out the sign uh, in our church sign. And uh, I noticed that there was some roadkill in the middle of the road. And so I'm like, okay, uh, you know, that's there. Okay, that's, that's fine. I don't know what it was. By that point, it was so disfigured that <laughs> I didn't really care what it was. It was just right there. And so I'm changing out the sign and doing all that. Then I kept on looking at it. And then all of a sudden, I stopped, looked over, and lo and behold, there was a bald eagle that came down, swooped, and got that, that roadkill, and whoop, off it went. I thought, did I just see that? That was so amazing that, that the eagle came down and swooped down and got that roadkill and woo, it was off very quickly. and It was out of my sight within an instant. I thought, wow, isn't that amazing about God's creation? And specifically, eagles, they, they see things from afar and boy, they are so quick. You know, think about an eagle that's over some water and he spots with his eye the fish that he's about to get. And it doesn't take him too long to swoop down, grab that fish, and off it goes. Yeah, that is the description of the horses and the horsemen of Nebuchadnezzar. So this people group, they are fierce. 
These people are military people. You think about Judah at this point in time, they haven't really been in too many, too many military conquests for a long period of time. So they don't really know how to defend themselves if they were attacked. And they will be attacked because Babylon is coming. Babylon's been, you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. About a hundred years before this point, Hezekiah, godly king until his his uh, his time where he he asked God for more time, and so God gives him fifteen more years. From that point forward, he is no longer a righteous king, but rather he's doing things because he wants to do them. And so the Babylonians came to him. They hear that he is now healed from his sickness that he had, and so they come and he shows them around. He shows them all the, all the gold, all the, the jewels, all, every, all silver, everything that he owned, he showed them. Isaiah comes on the scene. Says, Hezekiah, what did you show these people? I showed everything. Everything you showed them, now, thus saith the Lord, will go to Babylon. And within a hundred years, now Nebuchadnezzar is knocking on the door. <coughs> and so, it's amazing to see that God is, is able to use anybody that he desires to use. God allows Babylon to be an instrument of judgment, though they are more wicked or wickeder. Um, notice with me what else happens. Verse number 9, they shall come all for violence. Their faces shall sup up as the east wind. They shall gather the captivity as the sand, and they shall scoff at the kings, and the princes shall be a scorn unto them. They shall deride every stronghold, for they shall heap dust and take it. They were known to create um, um, ramps up a wall by just collecting dirt along the way and making a, a man-made ramp to go up a wall and down to conquer a city. They were known for, for doing that. And so, verse number 11, though, here's what is very interesting. Then shall his mind change, and he shall pass over and offend, imputing this, the conquest, his power unto his God. His God was, was none other than Marduk. Marduk, the god, patron god of Babylon. But yet, was it Marduk that really helped him do this conquest? The answer is no. God is the one that's allowing him to do what he's doing. Just amazing thing to think about that God can use. The last part that we see from the text, uh, that God allowed Babylon to be the instrument of judgment, though they are wickeder. Last but not least, God can use anyone or anything to accomplish His will. Think about that. God can use anyone or anything to accomplish His will. I say anything because I, I'm reminded of uh, the story in the Old Testament of, of Balaam. Balaam really, really wants that money. He really, really wants that money. So, okay, well, maybe I can go and I can curse Israel just like the king of Moab wants me to do. Okay, you know, he's, he's pleading with God, let me do it, let me do it. And God says, okay, fine, go, go and do. So he gets on his donkey and he goes and then all of a sudden the donkey sees the angel of the Lord ready to kill Balaam. And so he does everything possible in order to save Balaam. Balaam's life and then he gets so irritated on the third time that he gets off and he starts beating his donkey and then God opened the mouth of a donkey to say what God wanted him to hear just amazing he's supposed to be a prophet but yet a donkey was the only one that can get through to Balaam and in the text it's so funny that they actually kind of switch roles he says the, the donkey starts asking him questions. Why are you being, um, being me? And then eventually he says, well, nay, nay. <laughs> but in all reality, think about this. The donkey was used by God to speak a word in due season to a prophet that was all in it for the money. And if God can use a donkey, He can use anyone or anything. Like, for instance, Jesus coming into the city of Jerusalem. Everybody is saying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, and, uh, and peace to the one that comes in the name of the Lord, and um, glory to the name of 
the person coming in the name of the Lord. And then the, the, the Pharisees say, hey, you should stop your disciples from saying that. I love his response because it's absolutely true because he's, he's God in the flesh. He can't lie. Well, if they stop praising right now, the rocks themselves will start praising God. I thought, wow, wouldn't that be something? You're going along the along the right, and all of a sudden this rock starts praising God because of how good God is. And think about all the different times in Psalms that it says that the that the trees are clapping their hands or or the different things in the universe is actually praising God. We hear that the, the songs of the stars are actually echoing the very fact that God is supreme. And so it's just amazing. God can use anyone or anything to accomplish his will. We think about it, Jonah, he was another person that did not want to be used by God in order to save Nineveh. He didn't like Nineveh. It was the Assyrians. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. Why would I go to the enemies of God to, re- to preach repentance for them, hopefully to repent and to not suffer the wrath of God? No, I'm not doing that. And so he runs off. Of course, we know the, the story. He, he's in the midst of a storm. He gets tossed into the sea. A whale is there prepared specifically. Another thing God uses, anyone or anything. A whale gets him up. And God prepared that whale specifically so that Jonah would not die in the belly of the whale. Goes the right direction. Throws him up on the, uh, on the beach. And then he goes and to preach. And what he preaches, there's no grace, there's no mercy whatsoever in his message. He said, all right, hear this. 40 days and you'll be destroyed. And he goes off. Well, that was enough for the people to say, oh, but what if we repent and God is merciful and he will stay his judgment against us? And lo and behold, God repented of the evil that he was going to do to these people. Though Jonah, the unwilling instrument of God, God still used him specifically in a way that only he can do. So God can use anyone or anything to accomplish his will. So for us to think about it, God's desire to use us. He has a desire that each and every one of us to serve him on a daily basis daily basis we see that first of all number one we can see god can use anyone or anything to accomplish his will even us it doesn't matter who you are god wants to work in you and work through you to accomplish his will in the world today if you have never trusted jesus christ as your own personal savior that's the beginning place to understand that we can't earn our way to heaven but jesus christ did what what only He could do and purchase our sins for us by dying on the cross for our sins. And so because of that and because of His resurrection, we can put our faith in Jesus Christ and receive Him as our own personal Savior. And He, from that point forward, causes us to be the children of God. Causes us to become more and more like Christ from that point forward. But yet God can use anyone or anything to accomplish His purpose, even us. No matter what you have done in your life, God can use you. No matter what things that you struggle with, God can use you. No matter what, what you have done, no matter what you are currently doing, we can always repent and God wants to use us specifically if we humbly go before God and submit ourselves to Him. He can use anyone or anything, even us. Number two, not only that, but number two, God wants volunteering services. He wants us to be a volunteer, not a twist of the, the arm. We know about Jonah, just talked about him. He unwillingly uh, went to Nineveh. Now, I hope that none of us have that experience. Of course, that would be kind of interesting. Boy, that would be a story that no one would believe, that we got thrown into the sea and got swallowed by a whale in three days, and three nights later we got spit up on the, on the shoreline. Although there was a recent person that was swallowed by a whale that got out, which was quite disgusting, but uh, he survived the whole incident. And that happened, I think, last year. 
I remember reading the article, and I'm like, wow, well, okay then, that, that just proves the story. But yeah, God wants willing participants, not a person that, it has, you, that God has to really get your attention in order to have you accomplish His purposes. He wants to have us volunteer. It's echoing that prayer of what Jesus said in the garden, not my will, thine be done. I love what Paul says in talking about, about him having a thorn in the flesh. God gives him that answer. My grace is sufficient for thee. Number three, not only does God want to use anyone or anything, even us, not only does God want volunteering services, number three, He empowers us to accomplish His purposes. He empowers us. You might say to, to me that, oh, well, I can't be used of God because I don't have the right personality. You know, if there was a one person that had the personality that thought, God can't use me, I was it. When I was a kid, I did not like people whatsoever. I was the extreme introvert that I did not make friends very easily whatsoever. In fact, I was a loner a lot of my school eight, school time. Some kids you know, became my friends, not because of me, but because they were wanting to be friends with me. So that was, that was kind of nice. I didn't have to actually go out and, and be an extrovert. Um, but in all reality, God spoke to my heart. I got saved. And then I surrendered to the ministry years later. And I'm like, well, God, <laughs> I'm surrendering to you, but I don't see how you're going to do it because I'm not, I don't have that personality type whatsoever. I, <laughs> I don't know how to talk to people. I don't know how to speak in front of people. Uh, I, 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 it's, not, it's not me. And God said, yeah, that's right. It's about Him. God can use us. God can empower us to do what He has called us to do. As the, the old expression goes, He does not qualify the... Qual he does not... He does not call the qualified, but He qualifies the called. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so He empowers us to accomplish His purposes. If you think that God is telling you to do something that is beyond what you can do, well, praise the Lord, because He does His best work when that is the case. Rely on Him. Understand that the Holy Spirit is in you, is with you, and the filling of the Holy Spirit as we have more and more of God's Word in our hearts, more and more of God's presence being understood and relied upon, the more we're able to accomplish all that He wants us to accomplish. So God has a desire to use us, to work in us, to work through us, to accomplish His purposes. So what do we do about serving God? First of all, number one, let love propel you to service. Let love propel you to service. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, Paul goes through a lot of different spiritual gifts that, yeah, that, that's a great spiritual gift, like speaking in tongues. Okay, that's a great spiritual gift, like giving to the poor. Oh, that's a great spiritual gift of that, of, uh, of having great understanding about being a person that is able to actually speak very eloquently. That's a wonderful spiritual gift. But if all of these spiritual gifts are there and love is not there, then it's nothing nothing he says if i do all these things if i give my body to be burned to give my body as a sacrifice and i don't love it profits me nothing what an interesting thing to say love is the key to any service that we do for god and the more and more we love god now you might ask the question what what is love Love is a self-sacrifice deeming someone or something is greater than our own desires. That's what love is. A self-sacrificial um, desire to uplift another individual. Specifically, if we say, I'm going to die to myself and live for God, that's the greatest show of love that we can to God Himself. Let love propel you to service. May that love 
boil in us and may our love for God spill over into love for other people. Let love propel your service. Number two, number two not only that, be prayerfully considerate. Be prayerfully considerate. When an opportunity arises for us to serve, may when we hear what is said, may we instantly go into prayer. As okay, Lord, this is an opportunity. Is this opportunity for me to accomplish by your grace, by your strength, by your wisdom? Is this one for me or is it for somebody else? And you pray and God gives you the wisdom, God gives you the peace, whether it is for you or whether it is for somebody else. Be prayerfully considerate. We can pray without ceasing. This is one of the areas that we can pray about. Serving God and serving others. Uh, Last but not least, number three, leave the results to Him. We might say to ourselves that if we if we do this, then we will have many people come to a saving knowledge in Christ. Maybe, hopefully, perhaps, but not necessarily. Like we go back to uh, Habakkuk's time. He's a prophet of God. He goes with the messages of God, and the people that he's going to talk to, they're not going to take heed to his word. No, it's too late for Judah. They're going into captivity. Babylon is coming. The people that he's going to minister to, they are going to refuse to listen to him. So, in all, in our, our <coughs> excuse me, in all understanding about what today's uh, metric of success is in the ministry, we look at Jeremiah, we look at Isaiah, we look at Habakkuk, we look at Micah. These all, we look at John the Baptist, all of these people failed in the ministry from today's metric of success. Okay, they didn't have the great big mega church that you know, is in Jerusalem. No, they were actually refused to be listened to. And eventually, they were, uh, well, some of them were martyred. Isaiah was uh, sawn asunder. Uh, and so reality is, and Jeremiah died in, in exile from Jerusalem. Not by his own choice either. He was dragged along with him to go to Egypt. So did, were they successes? By God's standard, yes. Why is that? Because God had them do what he has called them to do. Though the results, humanly speaking, we can't really see them. For us, I hope and pray that each one of us can lead somebody to Christ. But if we are faithful to him, no matter the results, humanly speaking, no matter the results, humanly speaking, <clears throat> we trust him. We are called by him, we are his servants. And so we should lovingly say, Lord, whatever you want me to do, whether it's a success, humanly speaking, if the people of the world can say, wow, that person is a success or not, I am going to follow you. Think about it this way. Jesus was perhaps, you would think, one of the greatest failures if you're just going from his earthly ministry up to his crucifixion. Like, there's no way that a person in, in the world would say, wow, he had a major following. He then did all these miracles. Everybody wanted him to be the king. And then, he, okay, he kept on saying things that people didn't like and eventually got him killed. Well, that wasn't very successful whatsoever. The success is that he died for our sins in full and rose again the third day, doing exactly the will of the Father. And so, if we surrender ourselves to serve God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, if we love Him so that we can love other people, then we are successes for eternity. So we praise the Lord for that. I hope this has been an encouragement to all of us to serve God daily. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. We thank you for your word how amazing it is to know that you can use anyone or anything to accomplish your purposes. Lord, you want us, though, not to be like those 
unknowingly used by you, but you want us to fully surrender ourselves and submit ourselves to you so that you can be glorified, so that you can be high and lifted up, so that you, you will get all the credit for what you're about to do in us and through us. Father, help us to be uh, your servants through love, knowing you and knowing your love for us. Help us to show forth that love this week to somebody. Help us to know you better. I do pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.